chairs and the audiences of the SNS webinar in different parts of the world. We are back again with another week of educational lectures for you. The speaker for the first session today is our honorable guest from the United States of America, Professor Robert Dempsey. Uh, uh, Professor Robert J. Dempsey is, is the manager, Jawid Professor and Chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Wisconsin. He specialized in cerebral vascular surgery of intracranial aneurysm, thoracic endarctomy, and brain tumor, and co directs the UW stroke program. With over 35 years of NIH funding, Dr. Dempsey has multiple research projects with a focus on cerebral ischemia, vascular cognitive decline, and repair of the injured brain, with over 300 publication and hatch index of 79 and over 90 research grants. Dr. Dempsey is an award-winning educator and mentor, training a generation of students, residents, and faculty worldwide. He is a th three-time winner of Clinical Teaching Award as voted by the student. He helped co-direct the national course review in neurobiology. He is past president of the Society of Neurological Surgeons as an S and chairs for the Foundation of International Education in Neurological uh, Surgery, FITNS. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinar. And today he will be talking about the future of microsurgery in low and middle income countries, the importance of treating ischemia diseases. The second speaker for today is our honorable guest from China, Professor Guo Yu Xiang. He is the professor of neurosurgery at Huasan Hospital affiliated of Fudan University, also director of North Campus of Fusan Hospital, vice chair of West Campus and Fusan Hospital Fudan University. He majors in the cerebral vascular surgery and interventional neuroradiology. He has long been engaged in the frontline work of neurosurgery, clinical and scientific research, and is good at microsurgery. At present, he focuses on angiography, interventional and microsurgical treatment of cerebral vascular diseases. He master endovascular embolization, microsurgery and hybrid surgery at the same time, which could provide the best individualized treatment methods for patients. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker, and he'll be talking about multi-model treatment of AVMs of the eloquent cortex. The chair of the second session today is Professor Zubin from China. He's a professor of neurosurgery at the Huasan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai, China. Professor Zubin is a hybrid neurosurgeon and is also one of the giant in the modern cerebral vascular world. He holds the largest number of bypasses for Moya Moya diseases. He is currently the chief supporter of the SNS webinar from China. We are extremely thankful to him for his continued support despite his very busy neurosurgical practice. We are extremely thankful to Professor Zubin for accepting our invitation to chair today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS, the chairperson, Professor Raja, and our SNS president, Professor Yuvokato, I would like to welcome both the speaker, chairs, and the audiences to this online platform of webinar. Professor Dempsey can start his lecture, I think. Um, thank you very much. I'm very honored to be able to speak to this very large and wonderful audience about this future of cerebrovascular neurosurgery with a special importance on low and middle income countries. And this is no different than the future in high income countries because I'm dedicated to providing the same level of care throughout the world to all patients. But I will stress the importance of treating ischemic disease as we are redirecting neurosurgery toward what I believe will be one of the two major future areas of neurosurgery, which is the treatment of ischemic cerebral disease, along with that of regenerative neurosurgery. These are the two areas I think of great importance. As always, I will try to speak about what is possible in the low and middle income countries and I will always focus this on the training of our young neurosurgeons. And these young neurosurgeons represent the diversity of our field, the future of our field, and their work must be based on a dedication to what the patient needs, followed by a uh, dissatisfaction with our present treatments and a desire to do it better, which means they do research, 
and they promulgate it, that means they teach. So this classic idea of how we treat patients by improving the field research and by teaching our colleagues and our patients about that is the true triple threat of neurosurgery. I want to say a welcome. I'm talking from Madison, Wisconsin, which is in the north center of the United States, very rich farmland of the United States, not too far, several, a few hours from Chicago, but it is a classic example of a academic center providing service to a huge area of the central United States and the world. It is a very beautiful area, and I give greetings from my very diverse uh, team here at UW, where we provide care for really five provinces or states in this region, with people drawn from throughout the world bringing their expertise to people worldwide. This is what we wish. The topic we talk about here today is stroke or cerebral vascular neurosurgery. And I really want to emphasize during this talk the need for us to think about where the patient need is, and that is throughout the world, not just at the major centers, but how do we serve the low and middle income countries? And by directing our care to what the needs are, not to just things that fascinate us, and that's been true worldwide. Because neurosurgery has traditionally emphasized hemorrhagic stroke over ischemic stroke, yet the need for patients at least 10 to 1 is toward ischemic stroke. Yet we have mastered uh, those treatments for a small area of ischemic stroke and often we'll talk only about that at our meetings. I mean, at hemorrhagic stroke. So by emphasizing ischemic stroke, we emphasize the patient need which is truly present in hemorrhagic as well. I want to emphasize that the situation in low and middle income countries is changing dramatically. Where stroke was not felt to be a major issue in low income countries, when I started working in those countries many decades ago, it was primarily because of a lack of recognition and a lack of life expectancy. As we are changing the low and middle income countries and changing their diet and their habits, we are changing their risk factors. Some years ago, I challenged the United States Joint Section of Cerebral Vascular Neurosurgery about their priorities. I showed them that in a recent meeting, 95% of their abstracts at that time were on hemorrhagic stroke, primarily on aneurysms, and only 5% on ischemic stroke yet the patient need was the exact opposite. And I began to make enlarging my practice to include ischemic stroke, a very important thing because that's where the patient need was. Literally patients would come to my clinic and say, how's your research doing? Because they knew I was working on their problem. And what are we missing? Well, the American Heart Association, the Stroke Association of the United States thinks there are approximately 1 million strokes in the United States, and they are completely wrong. Because what they're looking at is people who are hemiplegic, blind, or aphasic. And I'm sorry, but that is not an adequate description of a patient's needs or wants when they think about the importance of their cognitive function because we weren't evaluating cognitive function, nor were we evaluating or thinking creatively about how we could deliver care to ischemic stroke patients. And that evolution, which you hear about today, including endovascular work, has changed the way we take care of high-income countries. It is my obligation to make sure that is available to low- and middle-income countries as well. And what we've been missing is looking at the small strokes and what their damage the cumulatively is to a patient. When we do modern imaging, which I'm happy to say much was pioneered here in Madison, Wisconsin, interestingly enough, the tools we'll talk about today, angiography pioneered in, in Europe, but digital subtraction angiography pioneered in Madison, Wisconsin that those refinements, or 
MRI imaging and MRI refinements of sequences from our medical physics team here. And when we use these sequences, we see as many as 11 million so-called silent strokes in our patients in the United States each year, totally missed by doctors who simply say, you're not hemiplegic, so it couldn't have been a stroke. But when we look further, we find that the need is far greater. And the need is essential, especially as our population ages. Because the impact of multiple small strokes is cognitive decline. And I've spent a lot of time looking at that. And to, to look at your post-operative exam and say, I'm satisfied the patient can move both sides and talk. I must have done a good job is not good enough. We're now learning that the cerebral functions of cognition, and that includes executive function. Cognition is different than dementia. Dementia is a very end stage where you cannot remember your children or grandchildren. That's quite serious. It's the greatest fear of our elder population is that they would not have their cognitive function to know their family. But 10 years prior to that, we see a decline in their creativity, their judgment, their executive function. And that is what's important to our society and to our function, especially important in government as our leaders age. So what do we, how do we study that? How is it important? And how is that important in low and middle income countries? Well, the distribution of strokes in the world is changing rapidly. And it's changing because one, we're beginning to look for it. It was always there. But in the low and middle income countries, if you travel there and you look how dramatically and unfavorably modern society is changing their diet, to tremendous amounts of empty calories, uh, tremendous amount of smoking, with the results being the risk factors for stroke, both hemorrhagic and ischemic, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, atherosclerosis are all rapidly advancing in the populations which make up the majority of the world. So we must be prepared both for prevention and treatment of a variety of hemorrhagic and ischemic strokes, we must do that simultaneously. We learn that different people are hybrid doctors. They can do both open and endovascular. I insist all my trainees are duly trained because if you can provide what is best for the patient rather than what technique you know, you will provide total care. And that's important, which means I feel an obligation to bring the modern techniques as well as showing how simplified techniques can be available for stroke care in the low and middle income countries. Let's start by looking at hemorrhagic stroke. We think primarily of those regarding aneurysms because we treat those and we treat those well, but that is a small percentage uh, a very small percentage of the actual strokes, although they're devastating. Vascular malformations, even smaller. But hypertension or perforator strokes are really the area where we're only beginning to touch the surface of treatment. We primarily look at prevention there. Now, aneurysms is what we know, what all those meetings are about, what all those abstracts are about, because we have devised extremely good open and endovascular treatments for this, realizing that most of them are preventive. They're most effective if we can catch the patient prior to the rupture, prior to the massive intracranial pressure, and prior to the lasting devastation of brain function. What we know about the clinical course is if they do present with a bleed of any sort, large or small, or so-called sentinel bleed, they have a very high re-bleed rate. The number one indication for repairing an aneurysm is it ever leaked in the past. And yet the morbidity and mortality of those leaks is devastating. Not only is the mortality up to 50% immediate, but the long-term morbidity affects 70 to 90% of the patients. 
70% with vasospasm, 40% with hydrocephalus, all areas of important research all areas we are trying to bring treatment to low and middle income countries because that's what we know. And I applaud that, but it is insufficient because the need is greater than just aneurysms. So what can we do? Well, both microsurgery and endovascular play important roles. And we must decide on our treatments because of that individual patient need. I do believe that there will be microsurgery and endovascular treatments of aneurysms long into our future as both synergistically improve because microsurgery can remove clot and removing clot decreases both mass effects and the known toxicity of the blood to vessels. And this affects both blood uh, vessels and brain function probably by affecting micro vessels. We know, for example, that by removing clot, we decrease vasospasm. Research done by Dr. Hoff decades ago showed that any clot, intracerebral clot of any source has ongoing toxicity. So this is an important adjunct if we can do it safely. We know that CLIP technology continues to improve and it approaches very high 90% complete treatment of that individual aneurysm. Endovascular neurosurgery is massively improving as we coil, divert, stent, covered stent, flow direct to try to treat aneurysms and treat their spasm. It does not treat clot. Its treatments are very effective for decreasing acute bleed or rebleed. The long-term um, efficacy often requires retreatment or recoiling, and that will change as techniques improve. But it still remains a very important and often initial treatment of the acute bleed because of the ability to treat a person even if they have intracranial pressure. Medical treatments of spasm much, must include, and hydrocephalus, the lasting effect must be treated. Surgical treatment is what we grew up with. It is still very excellent and active, but it is simply one tool. We don't do it on everyone because we like the operation. We do it on individual patients because that is the treatment which is best for them and the configuration of their aneurysm, whatever it might be. Now, the issues in low and middle income countries are identifying patients with strokes. We have been very poor about that because we've been overwhelmed with trying to decrease war, increase nutrition. But as we begin to modernize our medical treatments and get to more patients, we find more strokes. Risk factor modification is important. It is the hallmark of every doctor. Every neurosurgeon cannot simply be a technician but must be an advocate of change of the risk factors, hypertension and the diets that bring it about, diabetes and those effects, the preventive treatments. And to be cost effective, we must absolutely decrease the cost of endovascular treatment. So this relatively non-invasive treatment will be available worldwide, including low and middle income countries. And I know well that most of the cost of medical equipment is an artificial cost that is inflated by the need for the medical industry to pay their bills. So as we begin to use our creativity to develop cheaper shunts, we will develop cheap, cheaper catheters. I believe that firmly, and it will really revolutionize our care in the low and middle income countries. Now, a word about how do we use simple tools in a developing world for what seems to be very, very difficult operations. Probably one of the more difficult cerebral vascular operations we do are vascular malformations or AVMs. In our shop, they require a combination of endovascular and open treatment, radiation therapy, extensive uh, imaging, and interoperative tools, which allow us to monitor flow pressure, to do angiograms and hybrid suites, and this allows excellent care 
is it even possible to treat those in low and middle income countries? And I say, yes. And some tools are very available. I give as an example here, my work with ultrasound, which I've been working with decades. And the idea that if you take a simple ultrasound and put flow on, you will see every little nuance of that AVM in real time in the OR with a relatively inexpensive equipment costing hundreds, not thousands of dollars sometimes to be able to see. And the result is that I can follow the resection that I do and I can follow the completeness of resection. And I do not cut across the ABM because I've, you know, because the hole is deep because I can see every little part of it and I can be certain if I got it. And I've published and with ultrasound the ability to check vessels flowing into the ABM to see if they are of high or low resistance because the very low resistance ones are feeding the ABM and the higher resistance ones, the brain and the intermediate are on passant and they must be preserved. You can make those decisions interoperatively and you can do it relatively inexpensively. We can bring these technologies to the low and middle income countries. <clears throat> a word about this very important type of stroke, which is a hypertensive perforator bleed. You know, once it bled into the parenchyma, that it's either a pre existing lesion or a perforator, which are damaged by hypertension. You know that the aneurysms are on the outside in the subarachnoid space. These must be perforators. We have done very, very poorly on treating these people. Our major emphasis is prevention, but we're learning. Such trials as the MISTI trial begin to look at methods and benefits of removing the clot. As I said earlier, the, to the toxicity of the blood in brain chronically gives damage that goes far beyond just mass effect. And so selective surgery to salvage function is in our future. And that is part of the future of cerebrovascular nerve surgery. What about atherosclerosis and ischemic disease? I've been thinking about this for over 40 years. It started uh, with my work at the University of Michigan when I began to look at the pathophysiology of strokes and understood that much as I was fascinated by and loved to do aneurysms, the patient need was in ischemic stroke. That meant understand the disease of atherosclerosis. And as I began to study it again, I was dissatisfied with how well our patients were being treated. I looked at the science of our time and started to apply those tools and I began to teach it. And what we saw was the scope of a problem which affected them up to 11 million people a year. And this included small repeated emboli gradually robbing them of their cognitive function. And I felt that was important. I felt that we were stuck on something like degree of stenosis of carotid artery, and that seemed to be the only interface that neurosurgeons had with this disease. And so I wanted to improve that, and I wanted to go beyond it and look at the importance of embolic disease. And I began to look at this question of cognition. So we put on this study, which is the famous nun study. We looked at, at Catholic nuns, these are religious ladies who have exceptionally good diet, hard work, no risk factors, and yet tried to see, did they have cognitive decline? And what we found was that the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, the classic tangles, et cetera, that you see on the pathology was surprisingly common in elderly women but only triggered the cognitive decline, massive numbers, if they had had a clinical stroke, suggesting a synergy of stroke and cognition before anyone ever had thought of this before. And so we began to look at atherosclerosis. We used simple tools. We used ultrasound. That was the science of the time. And we could look and see the thickness, we could see the ulcerations in the, in the here at the carotid bifurcation from common to internal to external. And we could 
remove a plaque and we could check our work. This is my suture line, for example. And we could predict by the amount of plaque what the risk of heart attack was because it's a systemic disease. We could look at the thickness of the plaque and tell you how much they had smoked. And we could look at whether or not we had good results and began therefore to think about atherosclerosis as not a disease of stenosis, but a disease of the plaque of the wall. And that meant studying it. And so studying it, we did. We first looked to see if you had plaque, that meant you were depositing atherosclerosis. Why? And the nuns told us that that was inevitable at a certain age, 75 years of age in a female without risk factors, but each risk factor, diabetes, cholesterol, smoking, would bring it down 10 more years till you had a 45-year-old diabetic hypercholesteremic smoker in, the, in a male having their first heart attack. And at that time, we said, well, we can measure plaques. We're looking at cholesterol. Why don't we try to change it? And so we took one group and we brought them their cholesterol down with diet. We took another group and we took a drug, which now we know and we call the group called statins, but then it was a research drug. And that research drug lowered it to the same level, but it had more benefit. Diet alone did not stop the plaques from forming or the first TIAs or chest pain. But the drug did because I believe it changed the oxidation pattern of the cholesterol. Because that's what we found in the elderly smokers that caused their cholesterol to deposit the areas of bifurcations. The turbulent areas was the oxidation of their cholesterol, causing it to be unusable by its normal receptors. And so we began to study the plaque. Now listen, let's hear that noise as it takes place. It is, that's an embolus. We can actually use ultrasound to measure the emboli. We can hear it go by. We put the ultrasound Doppler probe on the middle cerebral. We can tell emboli. And so we had a tool. And if I was doing carotid endarterectomies because they had a lot of plaque, I began to learn that a plaque that was stable did not embolize. Yet an unstable one where they had thinned their fibrous cap was breaking apart. And I began to study who would embolize and who would not as a far more important and very simple measure of who needed surgery than degree of stenosis. That was based on their symptoms because if they had the emboli, they were cognitively declined. If they had the emboli, their brain showed the micro infarcts. And if I measured the plaques themselves and began to stop looking at just the plaques, but to see what are they made of, what triggers symptoms, then I would find that there was a whole pattern of disease. And that pattern was seen in the genomics of the plaque. So by partnering with the science of the time, we learned that there were 240 genes coincident with symptoms. The gene microarrays showed not only that they were like neoplasms growing in the wall of the vessel in response to injury and repair, and accelerated by changes in metabolism or diet, but they also aligned with chronic degenerative diseases of the brain, suggesting that that is a systemic disease of vessels. That's what we treat as neurosurgeons. Now we're beginning to treat the true diseases. And when we looked at that, we began to see clues. The plaques that broke apart often had formed new vessels trying to to make new connections to feed the growing plaque. Those vessels are friable and bleed. So when you bleed into your plaque, you could rupture it and embolize the brain. And so we measured which plaques are stable and which are unstable. And we can do that with ultrasound because every time your vessel pulsates, 
that plaque has to open or crack. And by measuring the cracks of a pulsating vessel, we could tell you whether it was embolizing the brain. And suddenly, surgery for carotids made sense as a stroke reduction tool based on the stability of the plaque, not the stenosis of the vessel. And we began to look at other strokes very, very importantly. We began to understand that emboli that are small, such as from a carotid, will get out to an M2 or M3 vessel, which tends to be focal for speech or motor or vision in the eye of amaurosis. But emboli that are large, like those from the heart, could block the entire middle cerebral, as seen on this angiogram, or the entire internal carotid. Now, those were the fatal ischemic strokes. They had such a large stroke that their brain would swell, they would die. We only recently have rediscovered the idea of doing decompressive cranies we have the moral ethical issue of whether or not the patient wishes to be preserved in that state. But then we began to look at the clot itself and began to say, could we operate upon that? And we made many false starts until the science of the time caught up to make it possible. And so the question is, can emboli be reversed? So use the science of the time. We're surgeon scientists we began to talk and partner with our chemists, our cell biologists, our physics, and our mechanical physics people. And we began to see, first with drugs, this was a 41-year-old lady in 1997 who came in with a cardiac embolus to her middle cerebral. This was a fatal stroke at that time. And we said, well, could we dissolve the clot? And we developed drugs that did and open the middle cerebral. We thought that this would be the, the end all and be all, but the drug is not sufficient. We just, when we see the risk and benefits, we're not seeing benefit across the whole population. But I was fascinated by the surgical technique. The idea of bringing a catheter to the clot meant that we would eventually be able to clear that clot. It would probably be mechanical, so at that time, I started to lobby that in the United States, all neurosurgeons need to be trained in endovascular neurosurgery, because this was going to be not only the way we would open a vessel, but we would deliver other drugs, such as growth factors for the repair of the injured brain, because that's the second great area of future for cerebrovascular neurosurgery is to repair the brain by delivering cells, proteins, and growth factors to areas that you wish to increase function. Just as now we deliver emboli to try to close flow to some tumors, we should think more creatively about this ability to help the brain. And because of this, I insist that this should be part of everyone's training. And I insist it needs to become part of the training in developing low and middle income countries. And all that came to fruition in 2015 when four separate studies showed that 40% of these cardiac emboli and their deficits could be reversed by timely mechanical removal of acute middle cerebral artery embolus. This revolutionized cerebral vascular neurosurgery. It made sense of everything we talked about because it meant that we must take the lead in prevention, treatment, and repair of the injured brain. If we think of all of those as our goal and function, then we are complete cerebral vascular neurosurgeons. So the simulation labs, the constant experience, the chief resident doing a thousand endovascular cases in a year is what we strove for and have achieved at Wisconsin. So everyone is facile at all techniques and does what's best for the patient. What about our carotid disease? What about that thing that we have been at the periphery of in the treatment, a few of us quite at the forefront? As we begin to understand that these emboli, the, the smaller emboli, which we only see when they are hit speech or vision 
or motor have been constantly hitting cognition and by embolizing. And we knew that surgery could remove the embolic source. That cuts the emboli in half, improve blood flow almost completely and durably. I routinely see 20-year follow-up patients from crowded endarterectomy with totally normal vessels. Now, in that interval, I've worked hard to change their risk factors, but it's a very durable operation. So I think it has a place in the low and middle income countries if we train our neurosurgeons to recognize and treat this important cause of stroke in their countries, because the risk factors leading to this are soaring in the low and middle income countries. So this is an example of what I want those people who are in the audience to understand. I dissect the knee, for example, this is how I do I'm it. And it's very simple. Every layer, as the surgery will need to be done under general anesthesia. I am very careful. I do it in a way that the could be done in the developing world. Circumferentially to allow complete and these are all control. techniques that anybody Again, can be taught or with great safety. Areas may be noted in the areas of greatest plaque. Once it is dissected 360 degrees, one may consider con control the vessels obtained with a These are techniques loop, that really bring out tubing. your surgical skill, but they other, cause us to understand blood flow to the brain, and does physiology, not catch on tissue. I secure it with a red Robinson. And you can see I'm demonstrating no techniques which are remain. simple and in media and any country in the world. Removed. First in the common, bilaterally, and then I carefully use a tenotomy scissor to cut the normal media proximal to the plaque in the common. Once this is accomplished, the plaque is removed, and in this case, inspected for a deep ulcer. The cause of the initial now, one symptoms. of the reasons I think this is so important is compared to what we can achieve with a stent, we have a perfectly clean wall. Irregularities of intima, which I removed. Perfectly clean. This is why they don't restenose. My restenose rate is three in 1,500. Hospitalization, maybe one or two nights, depending on comorbidities. This is an idea of a critical step so of just breaking it down to what you can do meticulous hemostasis and careful attention to avoid any brain ischemia. Postoperative concerns would involve ischemia or hemorrhage. Results are exceptionally good and patient satisfaction as well. Thank you. So the point is that this is a disease that we have the tools to recognize in low and middle income countries. This is a surgery that we can do and teach. And the benefits are enormous for the lifetime of the patient and indeed durable. Techniques are actually exceptionally important for everyone to learn. And I think quite possible. So what are the principles of what I'm talking about? The principles in the high-income countries and low-income countries are the same. We in cerebral vascular nerve surgery need to go where the patient need is. And to treat it effectively, we call upon our colleagues in science. That can be chemistry. That can be material sciences. That can be mechanical sciences. That can be medical physics. I've used all of them in my laboratory to try to devise better ways to treat both hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke. Those patterns of disease are changing and we will see far greater strokes in the developing world. And we must be prepared to treat both hemorrhagic and ischemic and take the lead. We deliver modern care to a region of need and its health systems will flourish. That has always been the principle of my teaching and the science that we bring to low and middle income countries. And what I am saying to all of us, my defining principles of surgical care 
You define yourself by your actions. You learn by listening. You listen and listen to what the need is in your country, in your own backyard, or worldwide. You act creatively to answer them. And that can be simple uh, representation of what appears to be complex surgery, so it can be done safely in low and middle income countries with tools that are available. You teach and you teach always. You teach your students, you teach your colleagues, you teach yourself. Mostly you teach your patients because they need to take control of their illness and their risk factors. They understand the surgery you're going to do on them and they're confident if they are taught to understand it. And always you do it not for your gain, but to leave this world better than you found it. Thank you very much for allowing me to give my principles what I think the future of cerebral vascular neurosurgery worldwide are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor, uh, for a very excellent uh, talk. Uh, we do not have a processor event with us. Now we open for questions. Is there any question from uh, panelists? Professor uh, Binzu, you want to give some comment? Thank you, Professor uh, MC. Thank you for your uh, such a information, uh, informative presentation. Uh, also, the uh, ischemic condition uh, related to the Alzheimer syndrome like, like this. So thank you. It is my pleasure. It is my pleasure. I do enjoy seeing you again. It's, 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 it, is, it is one of the advantages of this uh, you know, YouTube type connections are that we are able to at least see each other. I look forward to when we can be together again. Yeah, thank you, thank you. The next speaker is uh, Professor Ku, Ku Yixiang. Uh, actually, Professor Ku is the uh, uh, vice, vice chief of the hospital. And uh, he also did a lot of uh, vascular treatment, including the uh, thromboectomy. OK, now okay. let's give the time to Professor Ku. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, can we share the screen? Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, per Professor Xu and the Professor Robert and uh, and uh, our friends. So uh, today, my speak my speech topic is uh, uh, multi model surgical management uh, to the brain AVM in the language area. Uh, I'm coming from the uh, Hwasan Hospital Neurosurgery Department. So as we know, uh, a low bar trial, uh, the, the result uh, published in the Lessons magazine. And uh, according to the, the 2020 result, uh, after, after extended follow up, a low bar showed that the medical management alone remained the, the uh, superior to the inter. Conventional therapy for the prevention of death or uh, symptomatic stroke in patients with an unruptured 
green again. So at the total aloha area, there were three particles collected uh, in the search magazine, including the after survey. The first series that we turned for the reading according to the upper grade and the mountain grade, the upper series and the best two dimensions, even if the minor series of the chain challenge to our university. Such as the language area in Greek, we know the broker area and web area, which is the web area. So the application type. So the professor, the could you try to move a little closer to your microphone? It's breaking up a little bit. Can you hear me? Much better there. Okay. So, the lemma of the AVM in the language area, including the functional consideration, selecting strategy and the grading system, selecting method, and uh, how can we do the open surgery in the vessel treatment or use the, the regular surgery? So, uh, hybrid operation suit. So, uh, including the DSA, we can and in the operating room, we, we can perform the, the interventional treatment and we can use the, the 3D and geography into operating CT scan. So, and we can, now we can use the uh, neural navigation, including the uh, structure MI, function MI, and the MRA and the CTA. So, and the, uh, uh, Intra operating function evaluation, such as the awake surgery and the lecture to the audience monitoring. So, uh, treated the AVM by the combining uh, macro surgery, neural intervention, and the radio surgery. And now we can uh, using, use the, the multiple motor treatment of the AVM in language area. So uh, the, integrate, uh, the integrated company of the AVM treatment, uh, our aim is to cure safely and uh, efficiently. So, and uh, uh, the first one, the precise pre-operation evaluation, the second is uh, personalized the, uh, unnecessary protocol. Minimally, uh, the third is uh, minimally uh, invasive and uh, maximally safety staging. The fourth is uh, intraoperating monitoring and uh, multimodal management in hybrid suit and uh, uh, comprehensive treated method to achieve uh, curative treatment and uh, maximum function protection. So what can we do? How to achieve the minimal invasive and the maximum safe treatment? Uh, await reception for the language uh, related lesions. This is the, uh, my first case where we are uh, it.
and the different and the, the uh, partially uh, embryization with the uh, precise resection and the, the neurophysiology mo monitoring. So uh, I have five cases to resolution uh, my opinion. So the first one is uh, your navigation guide awake surgery. And the awake surgery for the brain AVM and uh, I reviewed it. Uh, article and uh, this the public published uh, in World Neural Survey in 2015. And we, we can see uh, not not too many cases for the, the awake surgery for the AVM. So uh, Firstly, we better understand for the language node and the, the tractors, the broadcast area and the Venix air area, and the, so many uh, tractors. And uh, so the uh, awake pearls, awake third surgery pearls is better protecting of the uh, neurological function more sensitive to neurological impairment, available for brain mapping and uh, subcortical stimulation. And that the pitfalls is a limited time for the operation, experience the anesthetist needed, higher ICP during the procedure and uh, not suitable for the high grade AVM, such as the fourth or fifth grade, or patient who can't cooperate. And the uh, general necessity, the purse is uh, easily management for the anesthetist. Better ICP controlled during the procedure more uh, endurable for the patient, but the uh, pitfalls including the protective of the language function, insufficient protection for motor function, even with the SEP and MEP monitor, uh, high demanding on the and uh, Thomas uh, make knowledge from the surgery. So this is the case, and uh, this is the female girl. Uh, this is the uh, uh, fourteen girl, and uh, the headache attack uh, three months ago. Uh, the the patient uh, front speech and the normal muscle stress. And we can see the uh, left frontal hemorrhage. And uh, we performed the VSA examination and uh, showed the uh, left frontal brain AVN and uh, specimenting grade two and uh, uh, lying in the language area. The feeding artery is MCA. So uh, we pre-operation plan is to the awake surgery and uh, integrated neural navigation, neurophysiological monitoring. So this is the operation. Firstly, we bought the, the language area. You use the, the uh, mapping. We, we confirmed that the language area, then we resected the AVM. 
and uh, at the same time, uh, when we uh, rejected the letters, at the same time, uh, we asked the patient to read and uh, and to some uh, speech uh, speak with the doctors. So. The ICP can control the wear because this is a very small and the net is very small. And the post, -op post -op uh, operation, we performed the DS examination, sure the AVM is gone. So uh, the blood recovered the wear. And so, and the Indication for the awake reception uh, in Hwasa Hospital, our team is the, the low grade AVM in function area, specimen grade two or three. And the, the, the patient should be uh, symptomatic and the, the nidus uh, with the smaller size, less than three centimeter, need to be careful. If, if the uh, more, more than three uh, centimeter uh, needed to be more care careful evaluated, uh, function area, speech uh, relative to the cortex or motor area, uh, superficial location, this is very important. If there's a, the, the deep location, we, we can uh, may, maybe the awake, Resection maybe is not not too too well. So uh, patient who can tolerate uh, alert, uh, early age decided by the anesthetists, uh, intact neurological function, frontal speech, detachable muscle stress. No psychological dysfunction, pre-operation training received. So uh, the second part is the, the immunization and the, the radio surgery. So firstly, we uh, why we from the the Embolization firstly be before the uh, radio surgery because we should uh, embolize the aneurysm to reducing the breathing risk, reduce the volume of the AVM uh, to enhancing the effect of the radio surgery. And uh, update reaching the fistula to control the wall. Uh, the follow volume. And this is the article and uh, sure that the uh, three rupture AVM spasmodic grade uh, equal or more than three grade and using the immunization and the radio surgery MIS include in all cases. This article published in Genesis in 2019. And embolization and radio surgery is effective in high grade AVM. Multiple embolization can improve the obliteration rate. So in our group, embolization uh, plus Radio survey is a uh, first choice for the silent AVM. So the uh, radio survey alone may be enough for the special matting two or three grade. State stage uh, embolization is reasonable for special matting four or fifths. Fourth or fifth lesions, 
and radiation can uh, promote the effect for the radio surgery because be conservative in embolization procedure. Embolization should be uh, indicated for the rupture aneurysm. This is very important because uh, if the rupture AVM and uh, say uh, just uh, using the radiology as a the breathing risk where um, may be very high, uh, may be high. So embolization is uh, uh, mandatory for breathing risk factoring, uh, factors such as the nadis AVM, fistula, and so on. If the feeders are applauded, uh, embolize the itch as much as possible. Be aggressive in uh, embolization procedure. Avoid the radio surgery in emergency cases. Rebreathing risk cannot be uh, ignored for after the whole procedure. This is the slippage for embolization plus radio surgery. So uh, in Hwasa Hospital, we totally and uh, performed the more, more than 100 cases. And uh, so this is the data, the data of the patient. And uh, our the uh, this is the outcome, and about uh, about uh, more, more than seventy six percent patient uh, got the obliteration, and uh, two cases uh, two cases the post gamma knife hemorrhage, three cases post gamma knife system formation and the five patients and controlled seizure. Uh, let's look for the these cases. This is the female, 49 year old, right-handed, aggressive, apostate for one year. And uh, we firstly we are using the onyx to uh, applies the nidus partially and uh, the feeding artery. And uh, two months later, uh, the patient received the gamma knife. This is the three years later, the patient got the, the, the DC follow up. DC follow up. We can see the AVM was gone. So uh, the third method is pre-operation embolization, and then we resect the AVM. According to the uh, Bishop Lawton, the seven AVM book, and uh, we, we can see about 41% uh, uh, 41% of the patient uh, received the embolization and the macrosurgery. So perfect uh, combination for the curative purpose. So we can use the, the one plus one more than two. So and the, the regular Resection hard to uh, in defining the uh, fragmental nidus extend. Uh, so we extend the resect is needed. But if we uh, pre operation embolization the partial, partial nidus, so post operation, uh, post the embolization the resection, resection around the feeding artery, onyx is, a, this is the landmark. So onyx is 
just uh, the landmark. So uh, we we can distinguish the artery and the, the vein. So uh, pre-operation embolization advantage is reducing the blood flow, identifying the body, the, the body clearly, reducing the volume, better control for intraoperative breathing, and reduce the surgery time. Disadvantage including the risk of the embolization, high expensive, not applicable for the giant AVM, high risk of, of recurrence. So uh, tens of the AVM embolization and uh, resection using the hybrid suit purpose one stage curative treatment. Comprehensive assessment is necessary. In creative image and neurophysiological monitoring, protecting the landmark People uh, did control the, controlling the anxiety is the only uh, is the only goal. Do not pursue curative embolization. Making landmark in the feeding artery using the onyx. Protect the function area. Precise dissection to uh, preserve the green tissue along the border uh, created by the onyx. Long term follow up is necessary. Uh, don't believe the, just the post operation DSA because and uh, we have some cases and after the resection, the neither's uh, we from the DSA at once, but uh, the patient is suffering the uh, hem hemorrhage several months later. So uh, we think the long time for wrap is necessary. So uh, this is the case. This is the case that 61 years old male, sudden uh, headache and weakness for right limb one month ago, we, we can see the left frontal hemorrhage. And this is the DSA sure that the left frontal brain AVM, specialist matting uh, grade two feeding artery is MCA. So firstly, we embolize the same the nidus. Then, we just use the very small uh, cortex that the, the resection the aneurysm. So the tissue and the artery protect well. So, and uh, this, this is the one uh, with the stage for the, the uh, embolization and the resection the AVM. So the fourth is uh, transvenous curative embolization. So, and uh, the history of a transverse approach. This article published in Neurosurgery 1999. And so transverse to uh, embolize the NIDAS. So the transverse retrograde nidus and, and the, the control the hypertension. So at the uh, uh, blood pressure controlled and the feeding artery accrued by the balloon, onyx inject via the vein. And then uh, analyzing the 
architectures, better diffusion of the matters. So we use the, the onyx. Professor Mohan said, and the and uh, why the vein can cure the, the AVN. So uh, some article published. So and uh, no matter if uh, T or uh, why the artery or by the vein, the girl is the the vein occluded. So and uh, uh, how we can do how and when to get the vein occlu occlusion. So when the article access is impossible, when artery uh, territory is functioning low too dangerous because the combined artery access and the vein approach needed the bad cure. So we use the, the uh, vein approach. And the Professor Shapur and the published the article uh, this year, trans the vein, uh, curative embracing the aneurysm. Uh, he used the uh, pressure cuckoo technique for curative embracing of a high grade brain AVM. So uh, he used the coil MBCA or broom uh, to the plug and then using the uh, press cooker technique. This is the, our case, uh, the patient male, 18 years old, uh, sudden severe headache two months ago, right up limb muscle stress is less than force. The CD scan showed that the left, left frontal hemorrhage And uh, in the local hospital, as uh, the hemorrhage resected, and uh, so, but the CT and the MI can show that the AVM lighters. This is the perform the operation DSA, and uh, show that the feeding artery. This is the other vessels. So, um, and the architecture of the nidus, we can see this is nidus and uh, some feeding art artery from the branch of the MCA. So, and uh, we decided to transfer the venous we punctured the uh, carotid vein. And uh, we, we can see the torturous signers and the, the vein is very torturous. So firstly, we used the J sheet and the microcatheter and the true and uh, into the vein. And uh, we use the, the uh, Apollo microcatheter. This is the detachable uh, microcatheter and uh, to uh, in, into the position, the right position. Artery angiography to check that the breathing and uh, venous super selected angiography to confirm. And uh, we also use the, the SR10 macrocatheter in position, and the second macrocatheter 
super select by the uh, shaping technique, uh, positioning distal to detachable point of the uh, Apollo microcassator. So the second one we use, uh, we use, we uh, you using to the, the plug. So firstly, we use the balloon control the ICA, artery blood flow control the well. So uh, they, they can decrease the, the forward flow and uh, accelerate rate on exit diffusion. So we as, yes, yeah, so we use the hyper form for the uh, for your control. And uh, we use the, the axiom coil, two coil and the, the 50% groove and inject. This is the uh, pressure cook technique. And uh, then we uh, injected the uh, onyx. So totally inject time about uh, Three minute, uh, three minutes, minutes. Finally, we totally embedded the nidus, including the nidus, uh, feeding artery and the vein. And uh, And the tip of the Apollo microcancer detached. So the patient recovered where? The principles of the uh, transvein for the AVN. I think the uh, curative treatment should be achieved. Uh, Pre-operation immunization is the uh, mandatory. Careful analyzing the architectures uh, for the DSA is helpful. Pressure cook technique is needed. We can use the broom catheter is effective and useful. Coil and the NBCA glue uh, can be used as the broom. Be patient to inject until Q. Detachable microcassette increases the fishing uh, fishing C. I think the uh, vein approach is the last choice for the AVM. If we have the, the other uh, choice. I I think that we we can use the, the other choice. So the fifth is a hybrid of operation. We use the, the transvein punctures. In this case is it the left temporal AVM, the male, sixty six year old, sudden onset. Headache and aphasia one month ago. This is the MI sure that the left temporal AVM CTA confirmed. Firstly, we used the uh, BSA and uh, we, we can see the feeding artery is MCA, single uh, drainage vein, but uh, the vein is very tortuous. So we had to uh, using the punching character vein to approach the, to get the position. So the surgical vein, we consider that the left temporal AVM in the language area, single drain vein, superficial, but uh, tortuous. 
resection uh, may destroy the, the language area. So with the treating stitches is we using the hybrid operation room and the special uh, we use the special uh, temporary NCAM2 occlusion by a left terror approach, AVM abrasion by a transvenous approach by vein punctures. So first we confirm the location of the nidus and the BSA and expose the drainage vein and uh, temporarily approaching the feeding artery. So this is the operation. We capture the drainage vein and uh, uh, by the vein, we inject the artists to the nidus. So uh, my last one can catch the enter into through the drainage vein and uh, retrograde access to the nidus and the DSA navigation. This is a hybrid uh, transfer vein for the AVM. So this is the we this is the after uh embolization the AVM. So the patient uh the where no FC. So and uh, for for the landing area bring AVM and uh, Dealing with the avian in the language area, safety and efficiency is a wide well of job and uh, an art of the neurosurgery. Knowing the team, anatomic uh, landmark and uh, brain function network warrants the safety of the operation. Natural surgery and uh, Neural interventional lesson B. Your hands, left and left right. Multiple model navigating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zubi. Uh, Professor Zubi, your comment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Ku, for your very informative presentation. And uh, you just uh, showed us very creative strategy for the uh, AVM's uh, new, new technique for the AVM treatment. Professor Robert? Do we have comments? Yes, I really congratulate the speaker on this excellent review of a very extensive field. I'd like to leave the audience with if he could give us his uh, you know, bottom line. We, for example, tend to be uh, very focused on the way we use embolization. Uh, if we can cure with embolization, we do completely. If we cannot cure, but feel we can cure with embolization plus resection, then we work with the surgeon and embolization together to say which vessels I as the surgeon want taken first. 
whereas there are some more superficial ones that I will take as my sequential resection, but there's some deep ones that the surgery will be safer. So as a result, we do not embolize completely before surgery, but rather strategically. Could, could we comment on your thoughts about that strategy? Professor Gu? Please couldn't hear the, your voice. Professor Ku. Yeah. Can you speak again? Because we couldn't hear your voice. We couldn't hear you, Professor. Can you check your mind again? Professor Zubin, you want to comment on that uh, selective uh, demolization? Yes, uh, I think the uh, the purpose for different uh, <clears throat> implantation, uh, like uh, preoperative implantation, uh, is different with uh, uh, curative implantation with uh, uh, totally with uh, onyx. So uh, preoperatively, normally we we will uh, embrace uh, deep feeders uh, if it's possible. And uh, then it make uh, it will uh, be helpful in the open surgery. Mm -hmm. And the professor Ku just uh, uh, he just uh, uh, give some case, uh, cases that uh, when you open the uh, when you uh, after the cryotomy you may select the punch the uh, vein directly then to the deep uh, deep vein. Then he injected uh, after uh, clips uh, uh, only one feeder. Then you can safely uh, inject the onyx and then cure the ABM safely. I think this is a quite new uh, new try. Uh, new try. Uh, it's a very uh, creative way. It is. It is a wonderful way, and I mm -hmm. congratulate this presentation. But it is not new. Uh, it actually, in the 1970s, mm -hmm. Sean Mullen at the University of Chicago mm -hmm. was doing this, but did not have the, the tools or the uh, embolic agents that we do today. So we learn very much by studying our masters. And Mullen was a master in the way he thought about vascular malformations and giant aneurysms uh, and the transvenous approach to them. So I think that what we have is a wonderful application of these physical features of the AVM, which are possible by our modern techniques to study. We mentioned the 4D DSA which of course looks at the progressive development of flow through the AVM. And if we understand that, then a very targeted arterial or venous embolization is possible. This is where we use our science to improve upon the dreams that our forefathers had. It's well done, well done. But for me, I, I will, uh, if I choose a cryotomy, uh, way, uh, open surgery way, I will receive the NIDOS directly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, actually, uh, just uh, uh, this week, I embolized uh, a, post, uh, a small AVM uh, in the posterior, uh, in the uh, cerebellar, small AVM. Actually, the injection is very, uh, very well. 
and uh, after the in implementation, the ABM didn't show anymore. But uh, just after one day, it uh, uh, it began to hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. So I open open it and uh, reset the ABM directly. Mm -hmm. It it remains so our it remains so our most effective treatment and definitive mm -hmm. treatment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I always hesitate to choose the transvein approach. I think it's a very dangerous way. Mm -hmm. Even uh, even you use some uh, protective uh, way to uh, use the balloon occlusion of the feeders, it's, it's still very dangerous. Yes, as our speaker said, it is his final choice. Yeah, uh, and what the talk, the beauty of the talk was, it showed so many options. It's our job to apply the correct option to the correct patient, with the goal being complete closure without deficit now or in the future. Um, and we must remember that with. Um, some of our techniques as to whether or not they will have toxicity down the line, either by radiation. Again, the surgery, you can leave a scar which can seize, but in general, if surgery is perfect, the patient remains perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And this includes even this, uh, the idea of a, a wake surgery, which uh, I do use a lot for invasive tumors that may be infiltrating speech. But in general, my approach to an AVM involves not resecting cortex, if at all possible. Therefore, my major thing, thought about function is on passant vessels must be preserved. And that's a technical challenge, uh, aided by some of our flow measurements, because we can see the different flow in an en passant vessel, which feeds normal and abnormal, compared to one that feeds only abnormal. Professor Dempsey, I have some questions for you, Professor, if you don't mind. Uh, first okay. of all, uh, thanks for, for emphasizing on ischemic stroke. But however, the reality is uh, most cases refer to a neurosurgeon uh, hemorrhagic stroke, even a small, very small hemorrhagic that we, uh, physician we tend to refer to us, but not for ischemic stroke uh, for, from both uh, 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 emergency physician and also from the medical. So what's your thought about this? Uh, how can we change that? My second well, question, Professor, can I, I have three questions for you, Professor. My second question is uh, regarding uh, awareness sinus thrombosis related stroke. Uh, how much can we do uh, regarding this? How do we identify those patients at risk and how do we treat my last question, Professor, uh, as, as what we usually do uh, for hemorrhagic stroke, we usually treat them or, or investigate them, them just with CT uh, imaging. Uh, however, for ischemic stroke, we use to request for uh, MR, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, what's your opinion regarding just utilizing CT scan, especially in low and middle income countries? Thank you, Professor. Excellent. So these are wonderful questions and they involve having vision for the need. So I felt that the problem was an inability to recognize the ischemic strokes broadly enough. And so I determined that I would develop the stroke program. So I have developed multiple stroke programs with combined leadership of neurology and neurosurgery. So from the beginning, we are talking about prevention. We are talking about diagnosis. We are talking about treatment and we are talking about rehabilitation. When a neurosurgeon says, I am only a technician, they will never see the patients. When you are involved in the diagnosis and treatment, medical and surgical, then you are making the decisions. So the answer for why I see ischemic strokes is because I study, I talk about them, I teach them, I see them in my clinic primarily. And that meant you must become involved in the stroke program of your hospital because you should be a partner in that. And that's how you get to see those patients. The need is there and the treatments are there. 
The second one, which is a different question about sinus thrombosis, and is there a surgical treatment there? Well, we see those patients again because we are expert in treating the intracranial pressure, the hemorrhage, or, or even decompression if needed. So if a person might need surgical, we see them and we intervene because we also run the ICU. I felt strongly just when I led the senior society at, in the United States, I felt strongly that all US nurse surgeons must be certified in critical care and endovascular for these very reasons. And with a few patients, we have been able to do transvenous uh, thrombectomy for the sinus thrombosis. In balance, at the present state of catheters and our understanding, we still tend to treat medically, primarily. But since we would be involved in the ICP management, the hemorrhage management, or the clot resection, we have taken those patients into our ICU and care. I truly believe that our transvenous approach to the sagittal sinus will be essential part of the treatment of normal pressure hydrocephalus, pseudotumor, and th thrombosis. The thrombosis, though, has a treatment which is medical. We do that first and only go transvenous when we see the usually young woman failing. Uh, and that is uh, probably shows that we're going late. So if we get better treatments, we'll go early in a preventive fashion. The final thing about um, imaging for hemorrhagic stroke, you are absolutely correct. I am not satisfied with um, on any patient that can be salvaged with CAT scan alone. Now, there are patients that come with a fatal hemorrhage, and we see it on the CAT scan, and we talk to the family about the patient's wishes, and we do no more investigation. But in the patients that may survive, I am very interested in finding out what was the cause, and could I develop, develop treatment? And I know that I will necessarily be doing serial studies to see if the clot is enlarging and may need surgical removal. So I am a big fan of doing the follow-up with MRI to try to get more diagnostic information. It might be simply that I see evidence of multiple other strokes or multiple other microbleeds, in which case, we're really attacking what are those risk factors, assuming the patient will survive. And I think that that will become important. So I can justify this because I'm as interested in the diagnosis and medical management and involved in that as I am in the surgical management. And the result when you do that is you do more surgery. Uh, and that's just because you find those patients who need it. Those are very good questions. I thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, any closing remark from Professor uh, Zubin? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Dempsey and uh, Professor Ku. Uh, totally, we have around uh, 1,300 audience in the WeChat channel that listen to this uh, fantastic webinar. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on behalf mm -hmm. SMS and uh, Professor Yogokato, I would like to thank uh, our, both our speaker, Professor Robert MC and Professor Gu, and also our chair, Professor Zubin, uh, for arranging the WeChat and, uh, the, uh, and uh, chair the session. Uh, with that, I thank to all speaker uh, audiences and also our chair, and uh, we see again uh, the next uh, webinar on Wednesday.